Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to zero in on verse number 7. There's a lot of rich meaning there in a message I'm calling Redeemed and Forgiven. We're jumping back into our study of Ephesians, and we're learning who we are in Christ, right? So far, we've learned that we're chosen and loved, we're accepted and adopted, and we've been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Well, this morning, we're going to learn that we are redeemed and we're forgiven. And not only that, we're going to learn how God redeemed us, how God forgave us. Now, as a reminder, verses 3 through 14 are one sentence in Greek. It's the longest sentence in the entire Bible. Now, it's thought to have been a song. Perhaps the Apostle Paul is, is pinning it for the first time here, or perhaps he's quoting it. But it has three stanzas with a repeating chorus. God chose us and adopted us to the praise of the glory of his grace. The Son, that's Jesus, redeemed us and forgave us to the praise of his glory. The Spirit sealed us and guarantees us to the praise of his glory. Verse number seven that we're focusing on is the beginning of this little section talking about the work of Jesus Christ. It says in verse number seven, in him, that's in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Now, in order for us to fully comprehend and grasp verse number seven, who we are in Christ in these verses, we need to have a better grasp on who we were, what our condition was before we met Jesus and placed our faith in him. Otherwise, we're not going to have a clue as to why Jesus died for our sins. We're never going to appreciate it like we should. Now, most people in our culture, they have some sort of understanding of Jesus. They have some sort of knowledge that he died on the cross or even that he rose on the third day. But I think most people don't know why. They just kind of know the story of Jesus. They don't really understand what's behind the story, what's behind those events. Why did Jesus die on the cross? And the Bible makes very clear to us. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. Now, the Bible teaches we've all sinned, right? Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, there's a lot of different Hebrew and Greek words that describe sin. But the most common word for sin means to miss the mark. It's an archery term. It, it, a person shooting at a bullseye at a target. The bullseye is the moral perfection of God. That is to be 100% in complete obedience to God. We're all shooting at that, right? And we've all missed. We've missed the bullseye, the perfection of God. We have sinned. We've missed the mark. Now, anyone who swallows their pride enough to recognize that God, in fact, does exist must also recognize that we've sinned against him. We have violated his law. That's self-evident, but the, the Bible declares also that it's self-evident. In fact, Romans chapter 1 teaches that God has made himself clearly known in his creation. He's written himself in the sky, so to speak, so that all of us, all of humanity is held responsible to him. We're accountable to him. Now, God has also made his moral obligations, his law, uh, known to everyone, because he's written them on our hearts, right? Right from wrong. Romans chapter 2, verse number 15 says, talking of the Gentiles who never had the Mosaic law, they didn't have the word of God, but it says of them, who show the work of the law written where? In their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and, uh, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. What he's saying is God's made right from wrong known in every person. Intuitively they know. God has given us all a conscience to know right from wrong and therefore we're all accountable to him. We all know better, right? Sin is a choice to defy God and it's a rebellion against him really. Now we're born with a sin nature but it's also a volitional choice because we know right from wrong in our heart. It's a volitional choice to choose wrong rather than choosing right. Because God has made himself known in creation in the sky. He's made himself known in our hearts. And most of all, he's made himself known in his inspired word and none other, most of all, his son, Jesus Christ, right? We've all sinned. I hope that's evident to you. But if for whatever reason you have trouble grasping 
the truth that you have sinned before God, I think it certainly should be easy for you to grasp the truth of the effects of your sin. Our sin causes problems, right? I, I assume you grasp what loneliness is like. That's sin. Suffering. The pain of broken relationships. All of that is a result of sin in our lives. Now, a devastating study came out this week, conducted in 2021, that found three out of five teenage girls say that they feel persistent sadness. Can you imagine that? Three out of five girls? One out of three girls, teenage girls in that study, said that they contemplate suicide. That's a, that, I hope that gets attention, that kind of study, because that is an awful, awful thing, a devastating report. Now, we don't have time to put our finger on exactly all the reasons why for, you know, that's taking place, but the heart of it is sin. The heart of it is a rejection of God. Our culture has rejected God. And the logical conclusion that these girls are coming to, they're arriving at, if there is no God, there's not really much purpose, Right? If there is no God, the pain that I'm feeling, that, that's how it's always going to be. It's not going to get any better. God doesn't have anything better in store. And that brings sadness. It brings depression. It brings anxiety. It brings anger into the hearts of a lot of people. The world has been broken by sin. We have been broken by sin. And the painful results are devastating. But did you know the greatest consequence of our sin is death? Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin, that is what we earn when we sin, the wages of sin is death. Ezekiel 18, verse 20 says, the soul that sins shall die. That's our penalty, right? Now look what the Apostle Paul said in chapter two. We're gonna look at it in the coming weeks. He's explaining uh, more about our, the state of our spiritual death before we met Jesus. Look at verse number one. He says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conduct our, ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Paul says, we were all dead men walking at one time. We were spiritual zombies is really kind of what he's saying, right? And, and in that spiritual death, there's this void. Our life is, is empty because God is separated from us and he's the only one that can fill the void. Now here's the other deal. We're slaves to sin. When we sin, we kind of get, it kind of entangles us, it wraps us up and, and we get enslaved to it. Look what Jesus said in John chapter eight, verse 34. Most assuredly, I say to you, Whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. We are all slaves to sin, but here's the deal. That means we're also slaves to guilt. Do you ever think of it that way? They, that, that people, before they meet Christ, they're a slave to guilt. They can't get away from it. Guilt is a, a dreadful reality, a dreadful condition that we've all experienced at one time or not, not in our lives. Now, one definition of guilt that I ran across this week is a feeling of worry or, or unhappiness that you have because you've done something wrong. <laughs> That's a bad place to be. I can promise you it's a bad place to live, and a lot of people are living in guilt. A guilty conscience is going to eat you up and it's going to spit you out. And you might try to run from it, but it's going to catch up with you, and when it does, it's going to take you down. Now, here's the biggest problem with guilt. The biggest problem with guilt is that we feel guilty because we are guilty. That's the big problem, right? Because we know, we feel guilty because we, we kind of know what's going on. We kind of know, the in, we have the inside scoop. We are guilty, right? We are guilty of sinning before a beautiful and loving and all compassionate and a holy God. That's who we were, right? So that describes who we were before Christ. We were enslaved to sin. We were guilty before an awesome and a holy God. Who are we now? That's what Paul is focusing on in these verses in chapter one. In verse number seven, we learn that we're redeemed and we're forgiven. Here's the first principle. 
We are set free from the bondage of sin when we're in Christ. In Christ, we are free, right? Look at verse number seven once again. He says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Now you may be wondering, what in the world does this word redemption mean? We don't use the word redemption very often in our culture, but in the first century, everyone would have understood exactly what this word meant. It literally means to release from the state of slavery by the payment of a ransom. That's what the word means. Now in the first century in the Roman Empire, there were about six million slaves. And occasionally, occasionally a slave uh, would, would do something heroic. They would maybe save someone's life. And the family that was a recipient of that heroic deed sometimes would choose to buy that slave with the purpose of setting them free. That act of purchase and freedom, releasing them, that act is called redemption. That's what that word is. Now imagine you're on a slave block, an auction block as a slave, which is an awful thought. One human bidding on another human is an awful thought. But let's imagine you're there. You're on the auction block and you're being sold. You have no idea what tomorrow holds for you. Hey, how, how, how's the new owner going to treat me? Are they going to beat me? What's my future hold, right? And then someone wins the bidding war. And you encounter that person not knowing exactly what to uh, expect. And they tell you, we bought you to free you. That would be an amazing thought, right? You are now a free man. You are a free woman. That's what this word is talking about. We have redemption through his blood. We've been freed. Jesus has bought us from the everlasting bondage of sin, and he's released us. Now, what exactly did Jesus free us from? Well, we're freed in several ways. We're freed, first of all, from the penalty of sin. We're gonna talk about that later in the message when we talk about forgiveness, but we're free from the penalty of sin, but we're also free from the bondage of sin. Kind of enslaves us, it, it chains us down. But look what Romans chapter six, verse 18 says. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You see, when we place our faith in Jesus, there's a lot that happens at that moment. There's so much more that happens, eternally speaking, how God views you, than what you realize in that moment, I can promise you. You become a child of God. You receive the Holy Spirit as a gift for you. On and on we could go about all that happens. But one of the things that happens is you're born again. That's how Jesus referred to it. Born of the Spirit. You become a new creation in Christ under his umbrella of identity, right? You're given a new nature. We're given a new nature. Which means the chains of our old nature of sin are broken. So that we're no longer bound by them. We don't have to obey the chains of sin anymore. Now, our old nature, here's, here, here's the deal. The old nature sticks around. That's one of the problems. We go, we, we battle with that old nature uh, every day or we should be battling with it. That what God has already won, what we sung about earlier. But we're not a slave to our old nature anymore. We're not bound by it. God has set us free in such a way that he now enables us to live for him. It means we don't have to live in sin. We can be slaves of righteousness. So we've been set free from the penalty of sin, the bondage of sin, but also we've been set free from the power of Satan. Look what, look what Hebrews chapter two says, verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, that's Jesus, likewise shared in the same. In other words, he became human. That through death, he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil and release those who through the fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Say, so Jesus frees us, right? Colossians chapter one, verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Before we met Jesus, our eyes were darkened. They were blind spiritually. Our hearts were hard. They were cold and callous towards God. Our spiritual lives, they were dead. We were 
in bondage to it. We lived under the power of sin, the power of darkness, who Satan is a ruler over. But Jesus redeemed us, didn't he? He bought us, he purchased us, and he set us free. And when that happened, we shifted, we shifted sides. We were under the power of darkness, Satan's realm. And when Jesus purchased us, we now came into a new realm, God's kingdom. We've been set free from that kingdom, and now we're free to live for Christ. We're no longer slaves. And that freedom, that freedom that we experience should should produce in us incredible steadfastness, confidence. Look at Galatians chapter five, verse number one. He says, stand fast, or stand firm, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. He said, hey, you've been free. Don't get wrapped up in bondage again. It's easy for Christians to do that. They get back entangled and all wrapped up and become a slave. He said, you're not a slave. You've been freed. Don't, don't live as a slave. Live in the freedom that Christ has provided for you. Now we read verse number uh, seven once again. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood. Here's the principle. The price for our freedom and our forgiveness is none other than the blood of Jesus. That's a, that's a valuable price, isn't it? That is a precious, precious currency. And that's what God provided to set us free. You see, God told Adam and Eve, he said, in the day that you eat of that fruit, you're going to die. Death means physical uh, and spiritual separation. Death is separation. Death's the penalty of sin, which means blood must be shed. Someone must pay for this rebellion. Now, every single sin is judged by God. I don't know if you realize that. Every sin is judged. Every sin is dealt with, and it, it provides death. Or else God would be made a liar, right? He would forfeit his goodness. He would forfeit his justice, and he wouldn't be a good God. But he is a good God. So sin deserves death, and every sin is paid for by death. Now, a number of years ago, I, I sat on a plane uh, next to a young Muslim man who was uh, from the Middle East. And I, I sat down next to him, and you know, when I get on a plane by myself, just on all honesty, all I wanna do is have some alone time. You know, read a book, uh, close my eyes, rest for a little bit. But every time it seems like the Holy Spirit just like taps me on the shoulder, it's like, no, prompting me, right, to strike up a conversation to tell this person, because my thought process is, in all the world, of every human being on planet that I could be sitting next to, God chose me to sit next to this person. So I begin a conversation with this young man. And our conversation goes to his business trips and where he lives there in the Middle East and a number of different things, but then eventually, we arrive at Jesus, right? And I, I try to get him to the resurrection because the resurrection is really the, the, the focal point. That's our evidence that Jesus came, came out of the grave, uh, changed all of history. That's what we hang our hat on. So I, I went there, but then he just had trouble. And he, he told me, he said, I admire Jesus. He's a great prophet. He's a great teacher. But he refused to accept that Jesus is the son of God. That's what hung him up. And then... He said to me, some, said something to me that day that has stuck with me many years later now. He asked me a question. He said, why did Jesus have to die to forgive sins? He said, Allah is, lo Allah is loving. He can just forgive sins of anyone he wants to. He didn't have to die to do it. I'll tell you what I shared with him. Here's why Jesus had to die. Because God is perfect. God is holy. God always does what's right. He doesn't let evil criminals off the hook. He's just. He's not a liar. He says the soul that sins will die. You eat that fruit, you're going to die. He's not a liar. He moves forward with this justice. He has to punish sin. He's bound by his very nature to do so. And really, that's the story of Christianity, isn't it? That's the story of Christianity, that Jesus stepped out of heaven, out of glory in eternity past the Son of God, and took on flesh. Why? 
to satisfy the justice of God and the love of God in the cross. That's what he did. God looks at humanity and he's like, I want to forgive, but I can't. Ah, but I can send my son who takes on the penalty, then I can forgive. Jesus died as a ransom. His price, the price was his very blood. Look at Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man, that's Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as what? A ransom for many. A ransom for many. His blood was a ransom price for our redemption, to buy us back. Shakespeare tells the story of Macbeth. Lady Macbeth uh, had blood on her hands for murder, right? And she goes and she tries to wash her hands and she can't, she can't get the stain of the blood out of her hands. She, she's thinking a little water maybe will get the stain out, but she can't get rid of the stain. It might be that your life is stained with sin. Failure. Maybe it's a whole list of things. Maybe it's one significant thing that your life is so stained by and you're like, I can't get clean. Whatever I do, I go to counseling. I pay a whole lot of money for the counseling. I, my conscience cannot be clean. I can't get clean. Here's the deal. The only thing that can clean you, the only thing that can take the stain of sin out is the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the only thing. Innocent blood infinite value, right? That's Jesus. First Peter chapter one, verse number 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct of received by tradition from your fathers. But you were redeemed with precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Look at Hebrews chapter nine, verse 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves. That's Old Testament, which was a symbol of foreshadowing of Christ to come. He says, not with that, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained, having gathered, having earned eternal redemption. Here's the deal. Sometimes people think, man, salvation, it's so easy it's so easy. Surely I got to do something, right? It's so easy. Here's the deal. Salvation is easy for us. But salvation was not easy for Jesus. There's nothing easy about the cross. There's nothing easy about the Son of God who experienced perfect relationship in glory with the Father and the Spirit. Stepping out of that, the infinite becoming finite and taking on flesh, human flesh, of, of being thirsty, of being hungry, of going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan, of, of, of being accused falsely, and then being nailed to a cross, a crown of thorns nailed, uh, shoved onto his head, beaten, spit upon, lied about, all of those things. That was not easy. He paid our ransom, and it was a valuable, valuable currency. You see, Jesus is the only solution to our problem of sin. I think if there was any other solution in all the world, God would have provided it. Anything but Jesus, right? Anything but the Son of God. But there was no other solution. He had to live the perfect life that Adam and Eve failed to live, that we have failed to live, in order to pay the price, the ransom price for death for humanity. Now, somehow, in God's mind, somehow, the innocent willingly dying for the guilty satisfies God's justice. You say, well, why, why is that? I don't know exactly. That belongs to the mind of God, but that's how it works. That's how he set it up. There's a lot of things I don't understand about God, right? I, I don't understand physics, how he created, he's not a physicist. I, I don't understand chemistry very well. There's a lot of things I don't understand. Why gravity, right? I mean, why did God create gravity? Why can't we just float around? That would, I think that would be fun. If you just turned it off every once in a while and we're just kind of floating around. <laughs> My youngest son, Titus, after the first service that he was in, said, Dad, that, why gravity? I know exactly why God created gravity. He kind of scolded me. That was an easy question. But I don't know exactly why he set it up with gravity. I have no idea. But he does, Right? 
He's God. He created the world as he decided to create it. He gave it physical loss that every one of us are subject to. In the same exact way, he created spiritual laws that every one of us are also subject to. The Bible teaches there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood. And if sins are to be forgiven, the sins must be paid for by an innocent life, right? Not an innocent goat, not an innocent lamb, but the very Son of God. It needed to be an innocent life and an infinite value life. Incepts Jesus, right? Jesus' life is of infinite value, isn't it? Now, our lives are finite, right? It means they can be measured. Our, every one of our lives can be measured in time and all kinds of different ways. If we added up all of our finite lives, all, we added all together, it wouldn't add up to the infinite, would it? The infinite is at, it's beyond all the finite. That's what infinite is. Jesus' life, his blood was of such infinite value that he was able to pay for the sins of the world as the ransom price for sin. Now let's read verse number seven once again. It says, in him, that's in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. What a beautiful phrase. Now this word forgiveness, it literally means to carry away. That God has forgiven our sins. He's carried them away. In the Old Testament, the Israelites were instructed to bring sacrifices to God. Uh, to appease and, and, and to atone for their sins as a covering. They bring pigeons and turtle doves and calves and oxen and, and lambs. All, all, all kinds of different things. But a special sacrifice was required one time a year on Yom Kippur. The day of atonement. Two goats were to be brought to the temple on that day. Now, one goat was taken, and it was sacrificed, and its blood was sprinkled as an atonement for sin. That is a covering, a covering for sin. The other goat wasn't sacrificed, though. The other goat was known as a scapegoat. We know that term. Someone's a scapegoat. Everything, all the blame goes on that person, right? This goat was a scapegoat. The high priest would take his hands and place them on the head of that goat. And he would pronounce all the sins of all of God's people, the nation of Israel. He would pronounce all their sins onto that poor little goat. It probably took him a while, that's my guess. And symbolically speaking, all of their sins were transferred to that goat. And then the goat was, was led out miles away into the wilderness, far away from camp, so that he could never return again. He was re released, carried away. That was a picture of forgiveness. Their sins were carried away, never to come back again. Here's the principle for you and I. We are released from the guilt of sin. That's a beautiful thing. We're released from the bondage of sin, but the guilt of sin. Our sins have been carried away by Jesus on the cross, which is another way of saying we're forgiven. We're forgiven. And there's no greater thing to experience forgiveness, to escape guilt, to be released from it. Jesus paid for our price on the cross and he carried away our sins. Isn't that what John the Baptist said when he first saw Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 29? He said, behold, the Lamb of God who what? who takes away the sin of the world. He forgives us. You see, Jesus paid our debt, our sin debt, and he carried our sin away in the process. God forgives us because of what Jesus did on the cross. Now, here's the deal. This is critically important for every believer to understand. God's forgiveness is complete. It's complete. No Christian... No Christian is a little bit forgiven. We're either guilty or we're forgiven. There is no in between. Psalm chapter 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far uh, has he removed our transgressions from us. He doesn't say the north and the south, does he? Because that could be measured, the north bowl, the south bowl. He says the east from the west. That, that can't be measured. That's, that's infinite, right? Right? 
There's no measurement for that. Look at Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 34. For I will forgive their iniquity. That's another word for sin. And their sin I will remember no more. In other words, he's gonna blot out our sin in such a way that he doesn't look upon it. He doesn't see it. He remembers it no more. Look at Micah chapter seven, verse 19. That God casts all our sin into the depths of the sea. What a beautiful, beautiful truth. That God casts all our sin into the depths of the ocean. Bertha Smith was a missionary in China. I love what she said about this verse. She said, God casts our sin into the depths of the sea, and then he stakes up a no fishing sign. <laughs> Here's the problem. A lot of Christians like to go fishing for their sin and their guilt. It's almost like it's become a companion to them. They don't know how to live any other way. They've lived with it for so long and God's forgiven them and they're like, they go fishing for that which Jesus has already dealt with. But did you realize that when you trusted Jesus as your savior, that, you, that it's no longer appropriate for you to go fishing for your guilt, to go fishing for past failures and to feel the weight of them? It's not appropriate. Not, not only is it not a good idea, I'm telling you it's not appropriate for you to do that. So, some Christians believe that God forgives them, but I'm not convinced they believe that God completely forgives them. And the reason why is they remain weighed down by past failures. The past haunts them. They're crippled by their past. Listen, when we place faith in Christ, our sins are completely forgiven. They are carried away by Jesus they're remembered no more by God. They're put into the depths of the ocean and God puts up a no fishing sign. They're dealt with. Now, here's one of the problems. Some people say, but pastor, you don't know exactly what I've done. Like I, I'm another level, right, of, of sin. I've done so many awful things that I need to still feel bad about those things which is another way of saying I need to pay for those things. And they do. They walk around paying for their sin that Jesus already completely paid for. They walk around in bondage to their past when Jesus has already set them free. They've been forgiven. And here's, here's, here's an awful thing. Some Christians actually think that's a pious thing to do. They think, oh, that, I'm taking sin seriously. That's not a pious thing to do. That is an awful thing to do. It's a disgraceful and dishonoring thing to do. It belittles the sacrifice of our Lord and our Savior on the cross. That somehow his life, his blood is not of infinite value. It's not worthy of paying for all of your sin. You gotta pay for him a little bit on your own. That is not acceptable. We gotta shift our mindset and receive what God has given to us and own it. You see, God accepts you and I as believers in Jesus the same exact way that he accepts his son, Jesus. And here's the deal. We've got to start accepting ourselves the same way he accepts us. Some people will say, you've got to forgive yourself. And I, I know what they're saying, but I think really what it's getting at is we've got to trust that we truly have been forgiven and embrace that and internalize that. Now, I think something needs to be said about our current failures, right? I mean, we're forgiven, but we become a child of God, but we still have that old nature we're battling with and sometimes we lose, right? And we enter into sin. What about that sin? Well, look at 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He says, if we say that we have no sin, that's like the self-righteous, I'm perfect people. We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, God forgives our past, present, and future sins when we come to faith in Christ. But when we sin as his child, just like when a, a son or a daughter does something awful to their parents, the relationship's damaged a little bit. So it's very important for us to confess that, and he forgives us in a way that our relationship is restored and, and whole. If you feel guilt as a child of God when you sin, that's a good thing. That's a sign the Holy Spirit is after you. He's, he, he loves you. He's pursuing you. But once you confess it, once you turn from it, and God forgives you, it's time to move on. <laughs> it's time to move on in the freedom of 
forgiveness with a clean conscience. Look at verse number seven once again. In him, that's in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Here's the last principle. We are redeemed and forgiven according to God's amazing grace. Now, this word grace means unearned favor, unmerited favor. We all struggle accepting grace sometimes because we're thinking, eh, okay, grace of God, let me, I need to do something though, right, to earn it. That's not how grace works. We have trouble understanding grace because our world doesn't operate with grace. You get a promotion at work, it's because you're your boss thought you deserved a promotion at work. You're a young person, maybe you're running a race, a cross country meet or something, and you win that race, you earned that, right? But with salvation, we don't earn it. We don't deserve it. We receive it. We receive it as a gift from God. It's 100% grace. Look what Paul is gonna tell us later in Ephesians chapter two, eight, nine. For by grace you have been saved, through faith. Faith is the channel. It's the means by which grace is received. And that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works. Lest anyone should boast. Now verse number seven says that he saves us and does all of these wonderful things of redemption and forgiveness according to the riches of his grace. And then he says in verse number eight, we'll look at next week, which he made to abound toward us, right? In other words, he didn't give us a little grace. He lavished his grace on us. Now, I want you to notice something in verse 7, the very end of it. It says, notice that it does not say from God's grace, that he gave it to us from God's grace. It says according to God's, the riches of his grace. Now, that look, sounds like, man, you're splitting hairs. It's an important hair to split. <laughs> it's a big difference. He said, God gives according to his riches, which he's a very rich God. You know, the Bible teaches proportional giving as a starting place in the Christian life. It's called a tithe. It means 10%. God's blessed us immensely. We give a little bit back to him as an act of worship. And we give, that's called giving in accordance with our income, in accordance with our riches. If a young college student is working and going to school and uh, they give 50 bucks on a $500 check, praise God for their faithfulness and generosity. That's incredible. That person is given according to their riches, right? But if a millionaire gives 50 bucks to the Lord's work, he hasn't given according to his riches, he's given from his riches. Make sense? God doesn't give from his riches like a little bit. He gives according to his riches. Think about all that God has given us. God has chosen us. He's redeemed us. He's adopted us. He's accepted us. He's forgiven us all according to his riches. And that doesn't mean 10%, by the way. No, 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 no. The Bible teaches that everyone who's in Christ, everything that's Jesus's becomes ours. <laughs> now, we're going to talk about our inheritance, Lord willing, next week a little bit more. So I don't want to get ahead of ourselves too much. But earlier in verse number three, it says that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. All that is Jesus's is now ours. Say, you say, you say, wow. You say, wait a minute. Some of you are saying, praise God. Others are you saying, I don't know about that. I know I don't deserve that. That's not me. I mean, you look at my life, that that's not that's not my life. I'm not rich. I'm not special. In fact, in fact I'm, I'm the opposite. I'm, I'm not special. And that's the point. That's the point. It's grace. The point is that none of us are. We've all missed the mark. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. That's why we all desperately need God's grace. We weren't any of those things, but now we are. That's the whole point of Ephesians chapter one, who we are now in Christ. We are precious, valuable, and rich trophies of God's amazing grace.